Hello, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, and welcome to Basic. How are you guys? Good. How are you? Great. Hello, Doug Herzog. All right. And meet. Uh, please meet uh, my co-host, our co-host, Jen Cheney. Hi, guys. Hi, Hello. Great to see you. So you. We, we start off every episode, we ask our guests uh, the same question, which I'll pose to you guys, which is, do you remember when you first saw cable television? <laughs> <laughs> I made Matt Stone laugh. That's a good start. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. Wow, guys. I remember that everyone getting cable before we did because we were up in the mountain. I grew up at uh, about eight thousand feet, so we, you know, we had like cousins in Denver and and places near, you know, that we would go see and be like so jealous that they had this stuff and we would watch it. And so my dad had to end up buying one of those gigantic satellite dishes. You know that you had to go outside and hand crank. Sure. And and <laughs> that that honestly was our cable until I was like I think like a junior in high school. Like we didn't have so so my experience with cable was always the, being mad that we didn't have it and all my friends did. But to, to before Matt answers, you know, to to be honest, Trey, that's really was the foundation of cable television was so that people who lived in places like you did. Right. Without great reception out, you know, not too close to a big city, you know, could get uh, well, it actually was in, in a lot of cases, satellite and cable. Yeah. That and I remember I, I very I remember putting on my moon boots and having to trudge out in the snow <laughs> and like crank it. And we had symbols for the to the lights of like, oh, you went too far with the dish. Go back with the dish. Like it was all like Morse code with lighting and stuff. It was pretty crazy what we went through to get those kind of shows. And how about you, Matt? Gosh, I, you know, I can remember seeing the HBO logo. Right. Zoom flying through the thing. I remember that. I remember MTV. I mean, I grew up and compared to where Trey, I grew up about 30 minutes from Trey, but it was the big city, right? So to speak, in Littleton, Colorado, where we did, you know, have cable. I think we were also kind of late to that because my parents were kind of not big TV people, but, but the kid across the street, they got cable. And once I think my memory from that was there was just more to watch, you know, before cable, we just, I mean, it's just like crazy, but I literally watched and Trey probably did too. We watched like, Gilligan's Island. We watched I Love Lucy reruns. After yeah, you school. watched what was on basically. In yeah, what was on every day after school. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I Love yeah. Lucy in black and white was being repeated in you know, a uh, rerun in the early 80s, unironically. And we we're just watching <laughs> kids. Gilligan's Island, Hogan's Heroes, all that kind of show. So then once cable came about, for me, I mean, I, it was especially MTV, but HBO and MTV. Well, first of all, HBO, and if you got Scanamax, you could see like something maybe, you know, for like we were perfectly 12 year old boys. So that was like a perfect way to see like some nudity or something you wouldn't be able to see on regular television. But for me, like MTV was especially like just a window to New York City or to the world, the world, you know, yeah. the world way beyond um, where, you know, we grew up there. So that's what I remember is the feeling of like expansiveness to like, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff, you know, that regular TV didn't show us. I mean, in some ways, it's you talking about I Love Lucy. I feel like that kind of gave me a sense of TV history that I would not have had if I, you know, had had more options. Like I had to watch those old shows. I don't know if you guys feel that way. You know what's really funny though, and I this I had nothing to do with this. I promise. I walked in once and came home from work, and my daughter was with the nanny, and she's watching I Love Lucy, and and I was like, what? And and the nanny said, Oh yeah, no, she loves this show. And like, she's just like, yeah. my daughter now is like, loves I Love Lucy too. It's you know what? I, I similar, the, they used to, in LA, they used to run it. Uh, maybe they still do after like the national baseball games on Fox yeah. in, in locally. And my daughter, you know, the game would end and they just like cut to I Love Lucy. And my yeah, daughter was no, a little girl I, and she used to sit there mesmerized by Lucy. Yeah, Ball. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is very funny. It's a great show. Yeah, it's a great, yeah. it's a great show. Lucille Ball, I mean, was, you know, she, were worth watching. Yeah. Worth watching. But like you said, Jen, it's like, it, what what we were watching after school, again, for me, it was just come over after school, you know, like, not my parents, because my parents didn't let us do that, but the kid across the street, you know, we go over to his house and eat candy and junk food and watch television, but all the television was decades old. Right. right. There was nothing contemporary. We were, we were just watching, I love, again, all those shows from the 60s, from the 50s. Or from the 70s, even, you know, like it did give you a sense of like you kind of it's funny that we know a lot of that shows and references and cultural references from a time way earlier, way from before we were alive, you know. Right. I did. I, I called my dad because I knew you're going to ask this question. So I was trying to remember through him, like, when did we have dish? When did we get cable? We couldn't remember. He's like, I don't remember when we did boost, but I remember what we watched the first day we got cable. And I'm like, what? And he goes, 
Conan the Barbarian. And I was like, oh my God. And it flooded back <laughs> into my head as I'm like, Sitting there with my dad watching Conan the Barbarian on cable, I completely remember now. And you're like, this is great. Arnold Schwarzenegger in my house with no shirt You don't have on. to go out and crank the thing anymore. <laughs> it's awesome. And as we're recording this, they're about to re-release Conan the Barbarian in theaters for its Are anniversary. So oh, I'll see that. This is all full wow. circle. Wow. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, the two of you met in film school, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Do you, can you remember the first time you met each other and sort of how you – figured out that your sensibilities were pretty similar? Film school is a little, I mean, we went to University of Colorado, which had a film department. <laughs> Fairly. Like, so so you, you, you want to separate yourselves from like the NYU and the USC guys, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. on one hand, on the other hand, it was serious and people there took it seriously, which was mm -hmm. cool. It was a really, really small department and super underfunded. And of course, everyone in Colorado was like, what the hell is that? Including, you know, like my parents were like film school because when we, the idea that it would be a, um, a vocation just wasn't something that you ever thought of in growing up in Colorado that you could make TV. Maybe traded because he was doing that stuff in high school, but I never even thought of that. So for me, I, I went to film school to just get easy credits because that's the kind of student I was. I think we met, we, we might have met in the beginning, basically it was beginning filmmaking, you use Super 8 cameras, intermediate filmmaking, you got these Bolexes, you know, that wasn't, didn't have sync sound. And I think Trey and I met in intermediate i don't remember do you remember Trey? yeah i think it was it was 16 millimeter and it was the school was um the, the only, they had some prestigious people but they were very avant-garde filmmaker they had stan brackett who was sort of well known for like avant-garde film and so the people that most of the other people that were there wanted to make very experimental avant-garde film and matt and i wanted to do far jokes so we pretty quickly we got paired together um to help each other with your movies and and i think it just it happened very Easier and naturally, mostly over a love of money Python. Uh, we would just right. start talking about Python sketches and stuff. So, fart yeah. jokes can be avant garde. Yeah, they I are. They're very avant garde. Now, one of the films you made in college, right, was the inspiration for the thing that really sort of um, got your career rolling, which is the Jesus versus Santa Spirit of Christmas short, right? But it started, you had made something similar in college, right? Yeah, it was just a. The thing that happened was at the end of every semester, there was a screening of everyone's student films. And so obviously for the fall semester, that screening would always happen the weekend before Christmas, before everyone went home. And so I just got this idea one that I was just like, oh, I just want to slip in like a little Christmas special, <laughs> like in the middle of this, because, you know, it's like and and uh, I had done a, a thing with construction paper called American History. And then Matt and I started like trying to figure out how we could actually sync up mouths. And we did it in a completely backwards way. We just started reading animation magazines about mouth shapes and everything and started cutting out different mouth shapes. And, and it's, it's funny because really still the, the mouth shapes in South Park are based on that very first right. animation book that we bought and, went and made these shapes. And we just made this thing just totally for the fun of it, just to like, and it was just totally foul mouthed and just to like, anger some people and and just to be fuckers you know that's that's, that's why we did it so. and then eventually you showed this to uh fox ex executive brian graden i believe who mm -hmm. loved it and then asked you guys to make another one which in an era before the internet somehow managed to go viral with vhs tapes which i yeah. just find I, I i have always found that very remarkable that people were copying it and passing it around it was absolutely viral i mean it was we were going to parties in la and people were saying hey you gotta watch this thing and they'd pop in a VHS and we're like, oh yeah, we made that. And they're like, no, no, no. We, I know the guys who made that. It's these guys over here. And we're like, because other people are taking credit for it too and getting beat mm -hmm. on it. <laughs> of course, Hollywood, yeah. Yeah. And so we put our um, names on it. Yeah, we <laughs> put our names on it. So it was just basically like, yeah, we were just doing it. You know, we, I don't, I can't remember what Brian gave us, but we were like, oh my God, we're rich, you know, because we had a couple of <laughs> dollars. And uh, we, we actually were out of school by then, but we came back to Denver and shot it here. And, you know, it was slightly better. You know, we learned more from the first one. So it was slightly better than the first one. And and then it went viral on VHS. And and like I said, it, it was weird how we were kind of famous. Like people in New York had seen it. As a guy who, you know, caught it when it went viral. And by the way, to Jen's point, 
to make a copy of the VHS was like a pain in the ass. Yeah, it yes. wasn't easy. Huge pain in it's, the ass. It's not, it's not like what we do now on computers. I mean, you yeah. had to make a real effort. So people were making a real effort to copy this thing and 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 pass it around and, and having other people see it. And yeah, I was one of those guys, of course, the great uh, Debbie Liebling, uh, who was a Comedy Central executive, said, I want to show you something. And she showed me The Spirit of Christmas, and I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. I said, could you play that again? And she played it again. I said, you know... I don't think we can do that, which of course you guys end up doing, uh, but, and then some. But I was like, I said, I think we should be in business with them. Like, find them. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, we slowly over the course of twenty five years got back to doing that. Like, we just <laughs> low burn got it back to that level. So before we jump ahead, though, but you know, you were still doing it on construction paper, right? You're yeah, still doing but... like the construction thing, even in the very beginning of the Comedy Central show. Now, it's, it's, the show's obviously evolved. The animation is beautiful. And I know you guys are super proud of what you've done um, with it over the years, but it was really like painstaking in the beginning, right? Yeah, it was awful. Yeah. The, the pilot episode, I mean, I don't, I don't remember how many uh, months we spent on it, but it was, just, it was just Matt and I in a dark room with a camera above us and click, click move a hand a little bit click click move a hand a little bit click click you know that was tedious it was <laughs> I mean, to go back to like we we had moved to la moved being kind of like sleeping on couches in la and we know we knew pam brady and knew a couple of comedy people and you know debbie liebling's name kind of kept coming up and to just bring it back to cable television by then I don't, you know by then what comedy central represented to us was nothing <laughs> No, 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 it didn't. It didn't. We didn't no, they had we were, we were nothing before you guys, you know that. No, but to us, it wasn't because, like, that was the kind of comedy we loved. Was I mean, right. absolutely fabulous was on there. What else? That's was right. There? I think Monty Python was on there. Yeah, you might add Monty Python, Python. Kids, in the hall? Kids, in the kids in the Hall, yeah, Kids in the Hall, Benny, Benny Hill, and uh, Black Adder, <laughs> Black Adder, a lot of, lot of Gallagher specials, yeah, yeah. yeah. But honestly, but for uh, you know, but for us, like. The idea we would, because also like Trey and I really, and this is like not revisionist history, like we hated shitty sitcom 80s, 90s, you know, what television had turned it into compared to the classics we were talking about before. We really hated that kind of comedy. And Comedy Central was like, at least I'll just say, when we, like, where do you guys see your show? We were like, Comedy Central. Like, that's the kind that, if we had our show next to that, that's where it belongs. Like, we really felt that way. And we really kind of sought out, I mean, I, I can't remember all the details, but I remember we were like, oh, we got to get we got to get a meeting with that lady debbie debbie liebling like she's the gatekeeper debbie was the was was definitely your champion there and pam brady who you mentioned uh which i learned at your 25th uh, anniversary celebration she's the one who sent the tape to debbie uh and yeah. that's how that's that's, right. that's, that's that's how i got there that part of it we we i do remember us thinking like wow comedy central would be not just like oh it's the biggest it's just that's where we belong like over there like that's, right. that's our kind of comedy over there we're not over there we're, we're over well, there we were i mean we were just happy enough to know like i bet we can get away with more you know we wanted to be we, we you know like i i we want to be doing that kind of comedy that we're seeing those you know they do and it seems like they get away with more and and we wanted to that's part of why we wanted to do it too Did you pitch anywhere else than Comedy Central? Because I do remember MTV making a big run at you boys back uh, when you were selling the show. We pitched to Fox and we pitched to MTV. Yeah. Right. But I remember I remember convincing you that MTV, could, based on my experience with Beavis and Buddy, would never let you do the show you wanted to do. Yep, I remember that. Of course, of course, I wasn't ready to let you do the show you wanted to do, yeah. but I was too naive <laughs> yeah. to know that then. And by, by the way, by then, I mean, we were huge Beavis and Butthead fans, right? So that was a, definitely a... Yeah. You know, that's something that said, hey, you know, like this can be done. But MTV passed. And Fox said, Fox said they would we, we should we needed to make it all about adults because no one wanted to watch a cartoon about kids. There you so go. they said that's why, you know, they're like, no, we have The Simpsons and it works because it's a family. Can you make it a family? And we're like, no, we really want it to be these four boys. And and that's not really why The Simpsons works either. I mean, right. in my mind anyway. Yeah. but Works because it's funny. Right. <laughs> so I know you guys did focus groups early on for South Park that were supposedly, and, B and Doug, I'm sure you remember this too, like they were not the greatest responses to what you guys were working on. Do you guys remember that experience? Oh, I can yeah. tell you what I remember, but let's hear from the guys. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to Colorado. So we got the pilot deal from Comedy Central. We went and we wrote a pilot script. The script got approved, I would assume. We went and shot it, which took months. It took us a whole summer in Colorado, basically, because we really didn't. It, it, 
we did that. We did it in the, the old way where you we use construction paper. So we actually had no plan on about how we would ever produce this at scale. We <laughs> just like, just get this one done. And we turned it in and then they fo focus grouped it and it focus grouped badly. It was like, as I remember, it was like off the charts, bad for women and not too bad for men is that what i remember right is that right doug you might remember. i don't i just remember it, there was like it probably didn't test great uh not that anybody was expecting it to necessarily but, <laughs> yeah, we're but like, yeah so then i remember i don't remember if it's before you are we ordered it let's try again with another script i remember there's a like we ordered just a you guys ordered just another that's right we're, yeah we're, honestly i would say from the comedy central standpoint just to interject the the short was the funniest thing anybody had ever seen. So the bar was so high. And then as, as Matt said, they, they took a long time to make the pilot. There wasn't a day that didn't go by for whatever it took 60, 90 days where people would say, where's the pilot? When are we getting right. the pilot? And then the pilot showed up and it was funny, but it, it like, it certainly, it was, it, it had yet to achieve uh spirit of Christmas status. Right. And then it, then it tested kind of funky. And then I think we went back to you guys and said, Hey, can we tinker this a little bit? Yeah, that's what I remember. But then I remember that Trey and I got check minus. We got we you did t-shirts. We got t-shirts made that had a big check minus on the front of them, <laughs> and we warmed to them. <laughs> to the to, you warmed to New York. <laughs> we warmed to New York. And had the meeting with Doug, and I think we presented. Did we give you a check minus t-shirt? I wish we still. Well, had I, I, yeah, I wish I still had it. I do have a. I had a check minus. You're thinking because Doug said, "You guys, come on, you guys. You didn't get a check minus. We all got a check minus. <laughs> <laughs> we all got a check minus." <laughs> <laughs> I also remember as part, you guys had come to New York and you, I didn't know you, had, I just had met you and, and hadn't spent a lot of time with you and you were spending the weekend and I said, so can we like uh, get you concert tickets or, uh, or a, like, uh, you know, restaurants? You're like, no, 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 we're good. We got plans. I go, oh, what are you doing? And, uh, you know, these are two 20, young 20 something guys sitting in front of me. Trey goes, um, we're going to see Cats and we're going to see, uh, I don't know, I think Fan of the Opera or something. <laughs> and I was like, and I, I thought they were shitting me. I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, yeah we, we, we like Broadway. And that was a, that was a, that was a little of a teaser to what would come next. <laughs> exactly. So then, yeah, there was an, uh, the Comedy Central ordered another pilot script that I guess was. Well, there was also another thing looming, which was we all kind of knew, like, okay, well, this thing took us three and a half months to make, working super duper hard. If you ordered 10 of these, I, I don't honestly don't know what we're going to do. Like, you'll get them in a couple of years. And we also, at the same time, we're kind of researching and trying to figure out, is there any technology out there where we can make it look the way it looks, but still basically do it on computers and be able to do it way faster. And so that was part of it too, was we were trying to solve that puzzle. How we would yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. Which you figured out in a fair amount of time. I honestly think that that's as big as, as as big as the sort of creative side of the show. It was it was the fact that we cracked that because Matt and I have always been kind of techie nerds, and like we we like that stuff. We like problem solving that kind of stuff and getting into technologies and stuff like that. And and you know having people. We had tons of people saying, "Well, you, you can't be done. You can't do this." And we're like, right. "Yeah, but there's you know." And we were looking at the Flash and things like that, and we're like. The technology is coming. It's like at least really close. And so being able to crack that nut is almost equally what made South Park work the, as the creative. Right. And it still retained that kind of charm of the of the way you originally started it with the actual construction paper. Well, and the fact, you know, what it became known for, you know, we could do it. We could crack a joke about something that happened today on an animated right. show. Which no one had ever dreamed possible. You know, so. I don't know if what, there were many computer animated shows before that. It was, it was a technically all animated on computers by the time yeah. went, except for that first one right, right. Yeah. yeah i mean it didn't look like anything else that i had seen on television in addition to also just being pushing some boundaries that i had not seen and did not think were possible yeah. <laughs> to, to push on tv either if you watch that first if you do want to go back and stuff, watch through that first season it's insane how tame it is yeah. it's mind-blowing how it's like something that could show on Nickelodeon today. It's insane. <laughs> it's insane. It didn't feel that way somehow at the time. At the time, it did not. <laughs> no, I know. And, and when, I remember when we were like, oh, my God, we're going to do a gay gong. Like, holy. A gay gong. Like, oh, my God, this is going to be so. Or, or the episode that came in titled, the script that came in titled, When an Elephant Fucks a Pig. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was like the, 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 the just the 
they're called the end of democracy, the end of television, this, all this stuff. But again, nothing, if you just watch it, it's compared to any, you know, now we're just swimming in filth all the time. Now, <laughs> now it's, you, you see those same jokes on Sesame Street now. It's pretty, right. yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> I'm going to put Doug on the spot for a second. Is it true that Doug Herzog thought it was a bad idea to kill Kenny in every episode? It's true. That's yeah. a true story. Tell us why, Doug. Why? Yeah. I, I was, I remember, I can remember like it was yesterday. They're sitting across from me. And I'm like, yeah, so, like, so they go, we're going to kill Kenny every week. And, and I was like, what? Really? They go, yeah, yeah we want to kill him every week. We think that's really funny. I was like, is that funny? I mean, and then I start into my thing. I could just see the looks on their faces. Their their faces are just dropping. They're looking at me <laughs> like I have three heads. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. That's a great idea, guys. <laughs> Everyone had their line. I remember with Brian Graydon. We were sitting there talking about all the funnies, and he was into everything and whatever. And then we pitched Mr. Hanky the Christmas poo, right. and his, he's he just stopped smiling, he stopped laughing, and he said, "I'm not going to be involved in a show about talking shit." <laughs> <laughs> like that's like a principled stand. And it was just not. It was just like that's my line. That was where he, that's where he drew the line. That's yeah. where he drew the line. Talking shit. With that in mind, I mean, like I remember watching that episode for the first time and being like, "What in the." Sh- what in the shit is this? Yeah. Like, I can't believe this is on TV. And also, but now I look back at that and I feel like you guys were pioneers in normalizing shit because now there's like <laughs> poop emojis, plush poop emojis on kids' bedroom, you know. Oh yeah, there's like children's books, of, you know, about poop. Yeah. Is there an award you can get for that? Like, I don't know. Yeah, we should. We need more awards. <laughs> Everyone in the poop. Everyone's in the poop now. Like we started the poop industry. Every, everybody poops. That was the eighth, so that was the eighth episode of South Park. So we did the first right. six and the and the rating. I don't, you know, Doug, you know the ratings game better than us. We had no idea. And the first show got like a one. It it took it took off literally like immediately. And it, I mean, was, South Park was getting no ratings. Outside, uh, uh, AbFab would get a rating, but outside of that, nobody watched you know anything. Like a one, and it, and it took off like a rocket. Yeah, like a one, and then went from there. And then went to two, and then yeah. next week it was like three and a half, and. So one boring. was like a home run. One in those days for 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 basic cable and certainly Comedy Central, a one rating was like a literal home run. And these guys started doing twos and threes. And I I, mean, I can't forget how high it got. But it got well, high. so I think I, do, I went. I think it was it basically. Then we got six done. I was like, great, we want more. And like, okay, well, it's going to take us like you know, sixteen more months or something like that. So the premiere was in August, right? And so right. then we did six, and I somehow God, I don't remember. I think we did a the. Christmas, Thanksgiving, Christmas, or what did we, Christmas was for, what did we do? Yeah, well, so the last episode we did, the six was Halloween special, and then we did a Thanksgiving special, started March. And we did a Christmas special, yeah. Christmas. so we could keep these one-offs going to try yeah. to keep the momentum up. Because we were averaging about a month per episode at that time. Real, I totally forgot that. Yeah. And so yeah. by the time the, eight, the eighth episode went on, so we've been on the air, we started in August, the Mr. Anki, Christmas Who goes on around Christmas, and that's when like we're on the co- like the show, not us. The show is on the cover of Newsweek, and that's right, Time uh, and, and Spin, TV Guide, and like everything. And all the magazines are getting fights with each other because like Spin oh, and yeah. Stone want to have it the same week, and they're having this like war, right? And then, like Newsweek and Time are doing the same week. It's like all that. And we've done eight shows, you know, and so it just took off so fast. We had we had the Bruce Spring th- Springsteen thing going, where like all the national major publications wanted them on the cover, and yeah. you know we were we were trying to negotiate it all out, and and then actually spin did an illegal cover, as I remember. Oh yeah, and, yeah, they did they did they did a bootleg cover, and you guys yeah. then got us because remember we asked, we said if uh, if we do the show with you, we want fifty yard line tickets for the Super Bowl anytime the Broncos happen to go to the Super Bowl, and, and who made good on that exact year they went to the Super Bowl and won for the first time, and we lost. <laughs> Trey called me at home as soon as they won the AFC championship. He's like, you got us, right? I was like, yeah, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm on it, dude. Don't worry about it. Um, and it was really like Matt and I just sitting there. Watched, you know, I'd never even been to a Super Bowl, let alone. And like you're watching the Broncos finally win one. And it was just like, what What else can go? Like, everything was just going right. You know? Life's pretty good, right? Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Then the downfall. No, I don't know. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you guys made a lot of episodes that, from the jump, that were considered "quote unquote" controversial. I, I guess I'll pose this to all three of you. Actually, was there ever, was there ever pushback on on anything that stands out in your mind? You know, were you ever surprised that people found some of the things you were doing controversial? I mean, God, I mean, so many I can't even remember. You know, I remember discussions early on about you know jokes here and there, certain things, and I have to say, you know, I was probably the most you know. At the, on the Comedy Central side. By the way, Comedy Central did not have a standards department. Right. 
until I when I picked the show up, I was like, we probably should get a season now. Because <laughs> so it didn't happen and, to you. And, and, yeah, exactly. and I've often talked uh, to our standards people and and their producer, the great Anne Garofino, about how they should do a uh, a coffee table book of the emails that go back and forth between South Park. Yeah, and the and Anne Garofino Park. coffee table email standards. That would yeah. be amazing. Yeah, yeah right. Funny yeah. Email for Anne. Well, part of the, the success of the show certainly bought us a lot of bought us a lot of freedom, right? It worked, right? So, okay, keep doing that. That definitely helped that the show was successful. And then, we, you know, in the second year we did, I think we did the second season and what, the third, by the third season we'd done the South Park movie had come out, mm -hmm. which even pushed right. stuff, you know, further out than that. So we pushed it far, far enough, ahead, far enough out and it was successful enough that I think mostly left us alone. But, you know, there was, there was always that week of like, and it was, sometimes it was a surprise. It's like, oh yeah, what, you know, oh that, oh, I guess we can't do that. Can we do that? But again, the show's success probably got us a lot of freedom. The critics, you know, a lot of people would, you know, would write about, oh, it's, you know, it's horrible. It's little boys saying bad words. And that wasn't the point. And you had to watch it. And if you did, you would see that it was really smart and really clever, clever and really funny. And so... They, the critics signed off on it almost immediately, and they started to fly, you know, with a lot of air cover in that regard, because um, they because they deserved it, they earned it, and then the the standards department, you know, and I think you guys would probably agree, even to this day, right? They give them a lot of room, and their attitude about a lot of the over the lines or things that people would think are over the line is that's what the audience wants, and that's what the audience expects from the show, and we should deliver on that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. hard to remember the all the if there was any, it was all coming from the right, right? It was we were considered counterculture, and the critics basically covered for us like doug said and it was all the catholic league that dude the catholic league always on our ass always yeah. one guy in the catholic league you know it was kind of came from that side of the equation was just the... i had to talk to him a few times including you know after <laughs> there was an episode with the virgin mary statue bleeding from her ass and yeah <laughs> he was also there was it was also there was a guy on the on the viacom board who was in the catholic league i had to talk to that guy one day yeah. what, what like we're like what <laughs> what <laughs> but there were also like uh, I forget what season it was when you did the Tom Cruise episode coming out of the closet episode, which wasn't like I don't know the conservatives would have cared about it necessarily, but it was a big deal to sort of focus on Tom Cruise in that way, and that and that became kind of a, a talker of an episode for that reason. Well, it was just scary because everyone knew Scientology was so litigious. Scientology, I mean, Scientology was definitely like it definitely had people were scared of Scientology in Hollywood at the time. Mm -hmm. They they or because they would just sue you, you know, For right? good reason. They're scary. <laughs> or, or put snakes in your mailbox. Really what happened with Scientology was that there was an MTV Movie Awards the year the Gladiator came out. And right. he did a short for the MTV Movie Awards where it was just a total spoof. It was Gladiator and when the John Travolta dumb planet, uh, what's that movie? That did oh, the shoot. It was the other uh, L. Ron Hubbard. Battlefield Earth. Battlefield. Oh, right. Right, yeah. So Battlefield and Gladiator came out. So we did a little like two minute spoof where it's like Cartman, I can't remember, he's Gladiator and he's in the thing. And in the end, he goes, well, and he, and he wipes, he wipes his ass with Dianetics because he shits his pants. <laughs> he takes out Dianetics and wipes his ass, right? And so it shows, we go to the MTV movie awards. We were there in the audience and it showed where I can't remember it was in LA probably. And we, it shows the audience and it's funny and it's, you know, goes to the next thing and like everyone laughs and stuff. And then it was like, there was about a four day lag between they taped it right? They taped the show and then it was going to air a few days later. And in that four days, uh, Isaac Hayes, who was a Scientologist, and of course we didn't tell him about that whole thing, you know what I mean? He mm -hmm. called to see if it was okay if I just would talk to this lady from Scientology, who was bugging him, right? Of course, right? Some lady from mm -hmm. Scientology was giving him crap. And so he wanted me to talk to the lady. I said, sure, give her my phone number, right? And so she called me, I didn't call her back. And then she called me, and I was just kind of like, and then she called and, and, oh no. And then Isaac called again and he, and I said, oh yeah, I just missed her. And he goes, well, do you want mine? They want to see what they heard about this thing happened in movie awards. Could you, they just want to see it. Right. And I go, sure, no problem. And uh, I'll just, <laughs> so I told them I'd send it right over and I made it sound like I was going to messenger it right over. And then I just stuck it. I'd stuck a copy of it in the mail. I took a VHS, like a half inch, half inch, like a VHS, and I stuck it in the mail, and I, I legitimately mailed it. But by that time, it had aired. Like I just kind of like ran the clock out, and so that aired, and that was the first time we got in the, like a thing with Scientology, and I think that got it going right. Of like we got to, mm -hmm. we got to, we got to do this. And it, the the Tom Cruise episode really was about getting sued, 
I mean, that's really right. like litigation, like overly lit- litigious people and like where the line is. And can you say this? Well, can we say that? Well, can right. we? That? And when they just picked a fight with us and we were just like, okay, let's just go. Let's just go straight. So I don't think we were listening to Tom Cruise's. We were into the Scientology, you know, but that episode, that that's what that's about is that right. very thing of just they, they bullied Hollywood and scared people into the it was really like you couldn't say the word Scientology. Um, you know. Hollywood was really scared of that at that point. So, Trey, you talked about the process a little bit. And to, you know, Matt's point uh, of what he was just talking about, you know, the show, once you guys got going, basically the way it would work, and I think probably to this day is, you know, nobody from Comedy Central really sees much about the show. They're the the show, uh, uh, Matt and Trey and their producer, Anna, are in touch with the, uh, the standards department. And I think the basic rule is like, if it makes it by standards, we're good to go. And you guys do your thing. And that's what they've been doing for 25 years. But, but part of the process, which I'd love you guys to talk about is you do it all within like six days. Yeah. Uh, there's a great documentary that you guys, uh, made about, uh, your process, but could you talk about how that, how that sort of all came about? You made, you made reference to it earlier with, with, uh, you know, slipping in timely jokes. Yeah. I think I, it, it, it evolved. It, it, what, what would always end up happening, depending on, it was all kind of all over the place. Sometimes we'd have a run of six shows. Sometimes it'd be eight. Sometimes it'd be ten. And we would, we would always, you know, try to prepare for the run and have a, you know, like a writer's retreat before and come up with some ideas and everything. But it always got to the point by the end of the season, middle of the season, that we were flying by the seat of our pants. You know, it was like we would just barely get a show on the air on Wednesday. We would all, you know, we would get it to, to you guys at, you know. 9 a.m. Wednesday morning, we would go sleep all day Wednesday because we've been up for 48 hours. And then we'd come back on Thursday and be like, all right, well, now we've got nothing for next week. So we've got to just, you know, and and at least the first, you know, the, the, the last few shows of every one would be that way. But we also started to start to see that like those shows would end up sometimes being the best ones because they were, they just had this, it, it, I really realized with us and with me, it's so much about momentum. You know, and it's, and it's, we've, we've tried many times in our careers where we work on something and we kind of put it down and then try to get back to it. And it's never, it's never good. It's always, and you know, those, but the ones where it's like, we've even had shows where like, it's the end of the run and we're exhausted and we can't think. And we, we go through a whole Thursday and can't think of anything. We get to Friday and we can't think of anything. And it gets to Saturday morning and we're like, all right, we're going to call Comedy Central and say, sorry, no show this week. But then we're like, let's just do, and I remember two of them very specifically, and and one was just like, look, we just got to finish one show. We got to be, and it's like, well, now we only have four days. And it's like, let's just do this dumb thing with Christmas critters, right? And and we just started doing it. And, but, but then we were just on fire because it like had to go, and we had no time to think things over and, and question them. It was just like, go, go, go. Go, yeah. And the other one like that was the Michael Jackson one, uh, the first, you know, the the Jeffersons was was one like that too and it was just like we really started to realize like okay this is how we work you know and it wasn't just it wasn't out of it wasn't out of uh, procrastination it really was you know because we always had shows that we would bank a show it's called where we would do a bit of a show we would do like half of a show before the run started so that somewhere in the middle of the run we could take a break and sleep for a couple days and then we would finish that show and those shows were always 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 the hardest to do and the least interesting and uh so we just learned that like this this six day thing which is very similar to what you know like uh, saturday night live does it's it's a it's 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 designed it's part of why the show is what it is and you still do it that way now you absolutely do it that way and it's like you don't have a lot of time to second guess you don't sit around going i don't know about that i mean movies and we've done movies and longer form stuff that takes a long time and those are great too it's a different it's a different skill kind of to like a joke five years after you wrote it you know, like, oh, yeah. go shoot that joke you know it's like <laughs> when it goes on when south park goes on the air most of the time we still really are laughing at it you know got- yeah sometimes sometimes the show would go up as we would say a technical term wet yeah which means the guys would the guys would satellite it over in pieces uh, because they were still working on certain pieces. I can remember taking to uh, Trey's point. I can remember taking some calls from Ann, like on a Monday, going, I- "I'm not sure we have a show this week." I go, "What do you mean? Like, how- how- well, there's not really an idea yet." Yeah. I, like, oh, okay. I do remember. I-, I do remember one specific instance. Maybe you guys could talk about this. Was election night, 2016. You had written the uh, election night episode, and I believe with the anticipation that Hillary was going to yeah. win. 
And I remember spending a long hour on a pretty dreary night with Anne, or uh, a long night uh, uh, with Anne that night um, as you guys were trying to figure it out. But there was a moment there she's like, I don't know if we have a shit. Yeah. And it was it was election night, so it's Tuesday. And I remember where it was about it was about 1030 at night when they started calling it and saying, hey, I think Trump's actually going to win, which, you know, like a lot of people were like, what? You know, <laughs> so it's just like and I just remember we're up there just erasing the dry erase board and trying to fill in gaps of like, how can we make this thing make sense? No, that was such a horrible night. I remember Ann, because she called you, Doug, I remember. And I just remember Ann telling me, well, Doug said, figure out, figure out something out. Figure it out. I'm at the Daily Show and everyone's crying over here. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, by the way, that's exact, exactly right. That is a quote. Yeah. yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> I will say uh, in, in front of the world, like Trey really, I was I was much more uh, shell-shocked probably. I mean, Trey probably was too, but I was, that was a, Trey was really like uh, 48, 48 points in the fourth quarter performance. That really was, a, you know, he, <laughs> I think Trey was like, okay, I was like, I was like, give up. And, and I, I think my, and I'm just cop to it. I think we shot, we have film with this. Our, our friend, Arthur Bradford shot the same guy who shot six days there. We have that. We're going to release it someday. We have the whole back. Oh, wow. I was definitely like, just, we don't have a show and just tell people why. And it's okay. Like at the yeah. end of the day, like no one's going to like, we fucked up. Don't show me. You know? right. It's like, it won't be the first thing. Yeah. And Trump just got elected president. So no one's going to give a shit that South Park wasn't on. Yeah, it's like whatever. It's not even the worst thing, the eight million worst thing that happened today. So fuck it. And uh, and then so Trey started racing the board, started really having to piece together a whole different show to make it all work. And um, I think we were up and that was an all nighter for sure. We were right? All all nighters, but this was like yeah. I mean we were up. We we're the noon the next noon on the day it aired. We were probably finishing that rewriting the whole show after three a.m. It was just yeah. the worst. Wow. And there's part part of it's a pride thing too because you know now now we get to the point where it's like. No, damn, we've been, th- we're not going to get, we're not going to not finish you, the show. Because I say you in, never miss in one, our right? entire no, we, we didn't careers, miss one. we missed one, which was, really? and it was totally because, remember the electric, all the electricity went out. Oh, uh, right? yeah. Oh, right. Yes. And, yeah, and we got, we did everything we could. We had like bands coming in with how we did everything we could. And finally, like two, we were like down from like Tuesday afternoon. And we're just like, dude, we can't even animate a shot right now. And because of the pat, that was the one we had to. A car, a car hit a telephone pole on Sunday. And exploded, LA. yeah. Mm. You did it around basketball when you were making that movie. You got the shows in. Yep. We uh, painfully figured out the uh, Prophet Muhammad episode. Yeah. You figured out Trump, yeah. but uh, but <laughs> I forgot about the electrical. Yeah. Uh, and outage. after that happened, I was like, Trey's going to start crashing his car into fucking things into the I know. <laughs> <laughs> get, out of, get out of doing it. <laughs> Where's Trey? Is he in a car driving up? Right Since you guys mentioned Trump, you know, your show has always, it's always been satirical, but with any satire, you sometimes get people watching it and not understanding that it's satire. And I'm just wondering, you know, the climate has changed so much in the past few years. Do you find yourself doing a different calculus about, you know, what jokes you want to do and what jokes you think we'll fly and what jokes won't you yeah, know it's the same jokes it's just different like <laughs> everything else around it changes but it's all comedy is comedy you know and it's just mm-hmm. like who's who's telling you not to say you know who who's going to be the most offended at, oh my god you can't say that has changed mm-hmm. and who those people are saying you can't say that you know when we started it was the super right-wing christians that were like hey you can't say that you can't put a gay dog in a cartoon you know <laughs> and now it's flipped to where it's it's you know a lot more of the, you know, the people saying, hey, you can't say that because that's not cool. You know what I mean? So it's like, same thing. Right. Yeah. It, I feel like it's, uh, I mean, Trump is an exceptionally hard person to really make fun of because it's just, what are you going to do? But I guess, I don't know, We that question, we like that question. You know what I mean? I think that's, we asked that exact question in the writer's room. Like, what's the, what's the point of view? I think that's what Trey's trying to say is like, sometimes it's just the POV okay, let's do the same story, but we'll do it from this character's POV instead of this character's POV. And maybe that's how you, you do the same plot. You maybe do a lot of the same stuff, but you get a, you get a, you get a shift where that satirical take is coming from. And we just enjoy, Mm -hmm. we just enjoy that process. So I guess, Mm -hmm. you know, not much of an answer, but that's we talk about that stuff a lot. And we try to work into a story and when deconstruct that. What's What's been interesting about the show is that we, we try to never, we never say, oh, you know, here's this topic. And you know what? I, I think this about this topic. So let's make a show about that. Let's make a show about what I think about this topic. You know, it's like we always just 
let's do a show about this topic and we'll have a lot of different opinions in it and we'll have a lot of different characters that say different things and are on different sides of it. And a lot of them, when they are meaty things, you know, I'll get to a point where on Tuesday, I feel differently about it than I did on Thursday because we've mm-hmm. been cramming in a writer's room, you know, and that's so many of your hours is spent just cramming on the things and the ideas and what you're trying to say and what, and then the show comes out and you're like, oh, wow, we actually didn't say that. We're saying this, you know, and, and like we didn't even mean to but i guess you know i kind of do see that now and you know so it's that that's it's a very cool thing i think it's one thing we got better at is making those shows less pedantic and more about the emotions behind all these issues Mm -hmm. and and asking like what is like what is the terry gilliam thing about asking questions not answer questions like you know in uh i just think we've gotten better at that and it makes some more it just makes more satisfying shows i mean hopefully we have gotten better at what we what we do hopefully <laughs> after 25 years of doing it maybe maybe we've gotten a little better speaking of that so you're you have a deal i think with comedy central through season 27 at this point halfway through um, halfway through that <laughs> halfway there what uh i mean in your wildest dreams did you ever think you'd be doing south park for 25 plus years no i have a fun you know when we were first making those first six i uh when i would get done with the final draft of the script I'd get my three hole punch and I got a really nice notebook at office max or <laughs> office depot. And I put them there. Cause I was like, you know, I'm going to have these six scripts up on my shelf for the rest of my life. You know, I was like, it'd be really cool. Cause I know we're going to do six episodes and I'm going to have, and I like did a really good job of like making this thing and putting up each episode. And be like, that's cool. I'm going to have these six up here for the rest of my life. So now it would be, I guess I would have about a 380 of them, but yeah, then we get six and then go, you know, I mean, I, there was a little, I mean, we were 20, whatever, in our 20s out of school. We were kind of pragmatic. We're like, cool, we'll do that, and then hopefully that'll get us another job. You know, I mean, I'm not, like, it was kind of like that a little bit. Like, hopefully we'll get a bigger job out of this. This is awesome. That's the way we thought of it. Trey, in the, in, the, in the minute that I ran the Fox Broadcast Network, Aaron Spelling was still producing, like, Melrose Place and uh, 90210. And I remember going to that crazy house he had for a meeting. And he had this library that was two stories tall. <laughs> And every, I mean, four walls, two stories tall, filled with leather-bound scripts. Wow. Every, every one of his shows. That's amazing. <laughs> Including T.J. <Yeah>. Hooker. T.J. <laughs> 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 Hooker and leather-bound. Like, <laughs> yeah, and leather-bound, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like 80 of them. How long can you imagine continuing to do this? Because... It is, I mean, as you've been describing your process, that's a punishing process. And I realize you're you know, you're doing six episodes or whatever. So it's not like you're doing it every day, all year long, but still that's a lot. No, I mean, the the long-term goal has always been to open the world's largest Mexican restaurant. And so, um, (laughs) and you've done it now. Well, we haven't done it yet, but we're, we're working on it. And so, yes, once, once we open the restaurant, we'll have to see, but But all bets are off. No, we've always, you know, we've been asked that question literally since season one, right? Like how, how long, how many of these do you think you can make? And, and there, you can go back and find articles where I say, "Well, it's not like I'm going to be doing this when I'm 40." You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like, right. like Mick Jagger used to say, "Yeah, it's just like, come on, you know that that'd be ridiculous." But you know, it's uh, obviously it's changed for uh, it's 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 more than just our show. It's our brand, you know, and it's our it's mm-hmm. it's uh, whenever we get back to it. You know, and especially the late, I have to, you know, it's like, it's always, it always sucks and it's always a grind and I always want to kill myself on every episode, but we, it's, it's, it's a good time too. It's. Yeah. And, and so, if you, so listeners understand versus most TV shows that run long. And by the way, very few have run this long. Everything that happens on South Park for 25 years goes through Matt and Trey. And that's, you know, if you, if you were to ask me, I'd say, that's why it's still great. That's why it's still inspired as long as. I always just say, as long as they want to do it, when I was running Comedy Central, I was like, they, they should do it as long as they want to do it. And as long as they're engaged and they're inspired, it's going to be great. You know, I mean, The Simpsons has gone through a gazillion different iterations. Still great, right? But, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but a zillion different iterations. To me, it is more like a band and it, they're more like albums because you can see, right. oh, this is where they were in their 30s and this is where they were in their 40s. And you can kind of tell they got married here and had kids, you know, and stuff like that. Like, you know, and that's what, that's what's interesting when you're looking at art, you know, it's like, and that's why we never wanted, you know, it was, we knew we would never hand the show off. It would always be either it ends or we keep doing it, but, but we still do absolutely everything that we did from the beginning. You know, we haven't farmed out any. When we come back for a new run, cause we also like, it, we're really, it, we also 
you know, we've done other stuff in our life. We've done movies, the Book of Mormon, um, working on a Mexican food restaurant, like Jay said. <laughs> and it's and it's awesome <laughs> concert this summer. Like it's fun to go do it. It's challenging, and I really love that we've gotten the, to not just just do that, but more often mm-hmm. than not, when it gets when we get to go when we go back to South Park, it feels like I mean, in a great way, it feels like a just putting on, you know, strapping on that guitar, putting on those old pair of shoes or whatever it is. Like, and we get back in the writer's room and it's usually, like nowadays, you know, we're always with funny people. And nowadays it's usually me, Trey and Vernon Chapman, who's um, our other main writer and Garofino's there too. And I always like, I'm always like, when we get back in the room and I get those first couple of days in the writer's room and hang out with Trey and Vernon. And it's like, I sleep like a baby. Cause I haven't laughed that hard. You rem- and I, you forget about mm. just laughter as a, as a stress releaser. And I just, it's crazy how much it's like, I hate going because the physical torment of the production cycle, but just laughing at stuff is for me probably kept me sane. Like just being able to hang out with like funny people and laugh about stuff, whether it ends up in the show or not, I want to like such an incredible job to be able to, it feels like home. Whenever we come back, it always feels good. You know, feels like home. All right. So uh, before we finish up, we got a, got a couple like fan oriented questions we want to want to get to. So the first one for me is, is, is there ever, uh, you guys ever think about a Team America sequel? <laughs> I know I know that was quite an experience making that as well. Very challenging. We thought, you know, it's like we watched the old Thunderbird stuff and we're like, well, that looks easy. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> no, that's not easy at all. You know, and so, um, but, you know, we still do love, I, I, I think that the thing that comes back to is we love the tactile nature of things. Like we we still love, instead of like, high special effects and high, you know, we'd love things to be, that's why we were so into Team America is just because the look, you know, seeing an actual puppet actually get hit by a car is so much more satisfying than a CG effect, you know, and everything like that. And that's honestly why we're into this big Mexican restaurant now is because it's got a puppet show and a dive show and all these things that we're like, just getting into the nitty gritty of like, you can't fake that. You can't, you know what I mean? It's like, it's just very, and and again, it's it's back to South Park too. You're just in this 2D world, and and I think that that you know that that has just become our brand. And uh, if there's a slightly easier way to make another Team America, that'd be great. But uh, it sounds pretty. Can't can't you figure out like the computer generated version of like the puppeteering like you did with 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 construction paper? I think the best thing about Team America is knowing it was almost even on set. You know, when it was like a, a puppet's head would just do the wrong thing. And we would all just start laughing. We're like, well, that's going in. You know, it was just like, that's the beauty of it. I went down to visit you one day, and it, w- it was one of the days you had the UN set up. And there were like, I don't know how many puppets yeah. were on the stage. But I know, I don't think he got a shot off the entire time I was there. But <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think I was there for like four hours. Yeah. But you had those controls at your hands. You were doing all the, you know, you were controlling one of them. But uh, look, you know, I, I hear that from everybody all the time, especially my kids. You're like, ask them if they're going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is sort of a fan question too, I guess. With Book of Mormon, is there ever a possibility of that being made into a movie? Because I know... Josh Gad was sort of hinting on Twitter like a few months back about maybe they could do like kind of what they did with Hamilton and like get the original cast back, do a live production and film it and put it on Disney Plus. But do you see that ever happening either in that way or in some other way? I mean, we could. We, it would be cool if we talked about it. I mean, I think we're trying to figure out a way to do something kind of at least a little bit different or a little bit like not mm-hmm. just what Hamilton did, you know, maybe do the actual movie that, you know, go to, that, you know, go to Africa and shoot it or, I you know, do something that's like. Um, different we just haven't come up with that idea yet really i mean one idea would be like because it's been 10 years and the original cast was so great and we have so many friends in that cast i guess it's the one that we experienced the most so we talked about doing a version of it where it's like what's that is it uh palm springs the old the seniors like <laughs> do the thing where it's like, <laughs> it's, it's, oh. it's done, like trey trey was talks about like there was a there was the evergreen players or something it's like it's a waiting for golf there's a you know we don't do like it's not on but it's not the old broadway it's the it's, it, we have really good actors, obviously. We make it really good. Right, right, right. right. Give, it a, give it a like a frame of like, Meta sort of spin. Yeah, exactly. Something. We just want to come up with something that gives it <laughs> another layer. You guys all have kids now. Um, you, were, you were a single young man when I met you. But the question I used to get asked all the time, and I had young kids when, when South Park first went on there, was like, do you let your kids watch that? <laughs> so now my question to you guys is, do your kids watch South Park? Well, I'm lucky because I can hand pick the ones that i know or you know there's there's a lot of south park episodes that are very family friendly well you said the first the first season apparently yeah no and i mean there's even in every season there's a couple that's like oh that's totally fine you know so uh right. we kind of hand pick them but she you know it's funny because i actually had her start my daughter started doing the voice of ike uh when she was two two and a half 
And, uh, and so she was saying some pretty, you know, and, but she learned from daddy and, you know, she's, you know, she's nine and a half now. And she, I think she's very well adjusted. And she learned that it's not okay to swear unless it's to make money. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's not, you know, I, I haven't gotten the calls from the school saying, Hey, your daughter said this and da da da. you know, she, she knows. And she, well, they're, well, they're not paying her to swear there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, she's not going to do it for free. I think I'm lucky. My, kid, my kids are perfectly there at that just pre-teenager phase where they just think everything I'm, a, I'm lame and everything I do is dumb and I'm the lamest guy in the world. I'm like, great. great. Just keep that. <laughs> Doug, should I ask the final question? Sure. All right. So this is another question that we ask of all of our guests, which is, aside from your own work, what is your favorite basic cable TV show of all time? Well, probably, I mean... Beavis and Butthead is right up there for me. Yeah, we uh, put Beavis and Butthead up there. Just like that, I actually laugh, watch, look forward to, laugh, still laugh at. I'll tell you, you know, a big thing that I grew up on watching. One and once we had cable, I remember was the the Christian Broadcasting Network, the the all the like CBN, CBN, and the and the um seven hundred club, seven hundred club, and and <laughs> Jim Baker and Tammy Faye. I mean, literally, I would I would watch that religiously. I could watch Tammy Faye do a puppet <laughs> talking about Jesus like all day long. Like, like I <laughs> love that stuff. Well, Matt and Trey, we have been looking forward to this conversation for a very long time. Um, we appreciate you being here. Uh, we know you don't do a lot of these things. And so uh, we were uh, very appreciative that uh, you were able to make time for us. It was great to see you both. And we're looking forward to Casa Bonita, uh, the next season of South yeah, I'm, Park. I'm booking my plane trip right now. Try yeah. the chicken. Plane. And anything might come next. <laughs> <laughs> So we finally did it, Jen. We got Matt and Trey on BASIC. Yeah, really exciting. And I have a lot of questions for you, actually, after that conversation. <laughs> right. Just because, I mean, I knew I knew this about them, uh, but like hearing them talk specifically about what goes into making that show and, and how it's turned around so quickly and how they're so intimately involved in every aspect, the writing, the voices, all of it. Obviously, that's very stressful for them, but you as an executive, that had to be stressful every week. It, 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 there, well, there's all kinds of stress. The, you know, the first kind of stress was, can we go to jail for putting this on? <laughs> Which is something I really <laughs> thought in the weeks leading up to the to the premiere. I mean, it was you just have to transport yourself back to 1990, whatever it was, 96, 97. You know, the edgiest thing on television was probably The Simpsons, Married with Children, and Beavis and Butthead. Mm-hmm. And so this this seemed to push that, you know, barrier forward. And I can remember I was always worried. I mean, I you know, we, we you heard a little bit about, you know, the back and forth on on some of the stuff they wanted to do. And, you know, that that really never ended. Um, and then th- th- it just took them a long time till they really figured it out technically. But I do remember in my second term at Comedy Central in the 2000s, every once in a while, I'd, you know, like get a phone. I'd, I'd call Ann during, Ann Garofino, their producer, you know, on a Monday and go, hey, how's it going? What's the episode this week? What can you tell me? And she'd go, uh, there's nothing on the board. Like uh, Trey's thrown like five things out and he's not happy with anything. And I, 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 you know, I don't know what to tell you. I go, you know, we have a show Thursday. She goes, yeah, 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 yeah. Or Wednesday. She goes, yeah, we, yeah, we know. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> um, I think. So I was worried a lot. Um, mm-hmm. But by, by the way, it was all worth it. I mean, what I, you know, Matt and Trey, as you heard them say, they outside of the electrical outage, they never missed a show. And they just always delivered, not only physically, but also obviously creatively, always, always inspired. I mean, just amazing. Mm-hmm. And was there a, an episode that stands out in your mind for making you maybe like extra nervous? Yeah, Muhammad. That you were going to get which, arrested? The yeah, Muhammad the, the, one. Yeah. Well, not that I was going to get arrested, you know, and we didn't, we didn't get into that. And I, I might have taken the whole episode and, it, you know, maybe that's another episode. And they were gracious enough probably not to bring it up. But, you know, we, you know, that episode almost didn't air. Um, they, they at the time, you know, sort of drew a line in the sand. I... I thought it was too risky to put on, and you know, uh, I I had a just for for our, the, our listeners' reference. Can you like kind of summarize a little bit what that episode was? Oh gosh, I, I I all I can I mean I should remember more of this, but basically they had they wanted to depict the Prophet Muhammad, and we were like, can't do that, and or we won't let you do that. And then there was a million you know different discussions around that but you know it, it it went all the way to the night before the show was supposed to air and there was a moment there where we weren't, weren't going to air the show 
Mm-hmm. And then Trey came up with this idea of like, well, let's just put a black box over it. And, you know, sort of like as their, you know, sort of protest. And, and he really wanted the show to air. So it, it did. And I always, I look, I, you know, I wish we had talked to them about this. I think their perspective probably changed, you know, a little bit over time, I think. Look, it was their job to protect their creative vision. And it was our job to protect, you know, the people who work at Comedy Central because we thought it might be something a little dangerous to do. So anyway, that was the call. And, you know, we, we lived through that. It was, uh, it was a moment. And God, other than that, you know, I mean, there was something, you know, there were things going back to season one, sort of every week, every episode that, you, that had never been done on television before. And you'd go, you'd just take a deep breath. And I will give a lot of credit to Debbie Liebling, who was the executive on the show and the one who, you know, really sort of pointed us in their direction. And then the, a woman named Eileen Katz, who was my head of programming at the time. They were very... Um, influential in pushing me and encouraging me to just keep on saying yes and trust the guys and trust, mm-hmm. trust, trust the guys, trust the audience. And, and, you know, it all seemed to work out. It has worked out. It has worked out for a very long Eric, time and yeah. still working out. Still working. Apparently. Still working. Yeah. So, but yeah, you know, it was, uh, God bless them. They, you know, they they remain inspired. They are, Always most inspired, you know, by South Park, and which is why I think they're 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 still with it, and they trust their instincts. And I learned to trust their instincts pretty early on, you know, mm-hmm. particularly after you know I was telling them they shouldn't kill Kenny every week, and they were looking at me like I had three heads. Yeah, these are these are the kind of notes that you get from a from a cable executive sometime, and then but someone like you admits they were wrong. Not everybody does. But <laughs> oh no, I was I, I was I was I was wrong a ton. I was wrong a ton, <laughs> but I would say I was right enough to make a career out of it. It's like being a baseball player, you know. If you can hit three hundred, you know you're going to do okay. I think you did pretty great, Doug. Yeah, yeah well, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a uh, it was a real treat to have them, and a thrill. Uh, they are two of my favorite people in in the world, and not only on not only cable television, and they are absolute legends, right? I think you'd have to agree there. Yeah, no, uh, I think that's fair. Yeah, and and arguably, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, you know, one of the great cable shows of all time, right? For sure, or any show. Hmm. Yeah, still vibrant, still, you know, still feels like right on time. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, when you make a show like that, I guess it kind of has to, because they (laughs) literally just made it seconds before you saw it. (laughs) Do you have have an all-time favorite uh, South Park episode? Oh, gosh. Man, I would really have to think about that. I mean, it's a a cliche answer, but it might be Mr. Hankey, just because the idea that that has become like a staple of Christmas is just hilarious to me. Yeah, I, I I have probably too many to mention, but I will say, you know, they were they were ahead of the curve on a lot of things, um, including Kanye. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think history I think history will be on their side somehow uh, when when they whenever they do get to the finish line. So. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for joining us on Basic. We had a great time with Matt and Trey. We hope uh, you did too, and we will uh, see you next time. 